two tornadoes. Project Vortex came into being in an effort to help solve that mystery. We have very little data from directly under and around the parent supercell. Without that data, our theories of tornado formation will remain just that. Theories. We don't know why tornadoes reach all the way to the ground. Seemingly ideal supercells sometimes just refuse to spawn a tornado. Look at those bands up on the... Isn't that incredible? Jeez. Look at that thing in the northwest. Yeah, I know. Why doesn't it do it? Eric Rasmussen, the Vortex Field Commander, will tell us more about the project well, we watch part of a vortex chase in the Texas Panhandle. Sometimes we're not sure who is chasing who. Mostly what we're looking at is uh, try to understand supercell dynamics and what gets a tornado to the ground. I guess by and large, everyone has a pretty good idea what it takes to get a storm rotating in the middle levels. And that is a certain kind of wind shear profile in the environment. But what it takes to get a tornado to the surface is completely unknown. And in fact, I think we probably know less about it than we thought we did, because we're, when we're going out there to the field, uh, the tornadoes keep surprising us where they form and how they form. So uh, I think we're gathering the data we need together to find out what it really takes to get a tornado to the ground. And it'll be the first time we've ever really thought about it or, or had good enough data to try to understand the problem. It's pretty likely that we'll find out that a lot of tornadoes don't come from storms that are supercells originally. Essentially, they turn into supercells at the same time they become tornadic. Oh, got uh, rotations picking up. Big tornado kinds, uh, about 50 percent down right now. The purpose of Project Vortex Look, was to try to gather data about one of the last great mysteries of tornado formation. Another one ra uh, that final around. step that takes the vortex from high altitude rotation inside the supercell thunderstorm to a tornado on the ground. The idea that supercells and tornadoes form at the same time, like this tornado, is an important one and presents a real problem for forecasters. Vortex may show us that some violent tornadoes give little or no forecasting lead time no matter how much radar technology is in place. Uh, okay, we got a tornado uh, spotted on the right side. I bet you want to know what we go to the field with. We take, uh, we take 12 sedans, nine of them we call mobile mesonets, and all they do is drive to particular parts of the storm and try to measure, uh, they have rooftop equipment for measuring uh, temperature, pressure, humidity, wind speed and direction, and position. Uh, using GPS satellite. And then we have three more sedans. Two of those are turtles vehicles to drop instrumented packages in the path of the tornado. And then this year we have three radar uh, vehicles. One is a brand new mobile scanning Doppler, uh, the first of its kind anywhere, and it's getting tremendous data. And then we have Howie Bluestein's two vehicles. One is a, a uh, millimeter wave Doppler from the University of Massachusetts, and the other one is a uh, FMCW Doppler that they just point by hand, a couple of rabbit ears antennas on it. Uh, there's two aircraft. One's the NOAA P-3, the hurricane plane. And it has a, a radar in its belly that scans horizontally and like a conventional radar. And then it has a radar in its tail, which scans vertically. It's a do the tail radar is a Doppler radar, and it just takes slices of velocity and reflectivity through the storm as it flies along. Then the other aircraft is the NCAR Electra. And it's in the same family of aircraft, I guess, as the P-3, four-engine turboprop with slightly smaller engines, I guess, than the P-3. And 
It also has a tail radar, just like the P3s, which takes vertical slices. On May 22nd, Joe Golden rode in the P3, along with visiting scientists from other countries. There's a hail shaft. We're looking west. We're on the west. I'm looking east. We're on the west side of the line, headed south now. That's northeast, east. And we have a flanking line. There's the top of the storm. Wow. Beautiful. That is a beautiful Anybody storm. A view of this oh, yeah. thing. Take a look it's got a flanking line down. right there. It's got a classic flanking line. And, and this with luck, we'll have a wall cloud where the flanking line intersects the main body of the storm. There's the hail shaft. We ran into some face yeah, well, maybe larger size hill. We lost most of the front window and all of the back. <laughs> and we're waiting for the over here, hail to subside. Right? Yeah, that's what Damaged vehicles and the lack of a tornado is not a sign of failure. Every vehicle gathered a continuous flow under and around a spectacular storm that refused to spawn a tornado. There is the Electra. There is the Electra. Beautiful. It was said that the Electra and the P3 were the only Vortex vehicles without a cracked windshield. The probe vehicles are not supposed to charge directly at the tornado. They all have specific missions in specific parts of the storm. Only a few probes get to go up close and personal with the tornado. We're in the Bower Clinic zone, right? Each team has uh, these things we call activity cards. And they're different for each team. And it shows a picture of what the storm looks like and where that team's supposed to be operating. And then on the, on the back side of the card, it lists exactly what the team should be looking for and what kind of data they should be collecting. So all I do is say that we're in this activity. Let's see, this one's the slow-moving HP storm. If I announce that we're in HPS, then teams each pull out their own uh, customized activity card for HPS and it gives them a little bit of a, a briefing on uh, what they should be doing. Vortex had some real successes in 1995. This tornado formed less than a half mile west of the Armada. Some cars stopped, others sped up, and the tornado passed between them. Go north. Go north. Go north. Oh, that's going to take that. Very close. Oh, my God, I took a sign or something. Watch out for the brief on this side. Yeah, be very careful. Put your head down. Damn. Nine vehicles recorded data from within a mile of the tornado. Okay. Okay, it's past us. Fifteen miles to the northeast, they again crossed the damage path just behind the rain-wrapped tornado. Look ahead. The first nine days in June 1995 was one of the most spectacular times in the brief history of storm chasing and the high point of the project. The story begins near Friona, Texas. The Friona storm provided good data, but the best was yet to come.
After the Friona tornado roped out, Eric decided to ignore a promising storm nearby because it would eventually move into an area without roads. Instead, he directed the Armada to another growing storm, 30 miles to the east near Dimmit. All the vehicles and the tornado were finally in place where they were supposed to be. The funnel was literally surrounded by instrumentation and radar for its entire life cycle. See the flash? Yeah. There it goes. See the debris? 